What's going on, everybody? Welcome in to a special edition of the Daily Energy Newsbeat stand-up here on this gorgeous Saturday, February 10th, 2024. We are our, we got our weekly recap here. I'm here live at NAPE with Stuart Turley, um, and, and we are just excited to bring you the best uh, articles from this week. We we've had to do some. We've got some great shows. I've got to oh, see yeah, you in person. We've, we've got R.T. Trevino right yep. here. We've got David Blackman right over here. It has been a great week here. Yep, and we and we are looking forward to it. So without further ado, we're going to kick it over to the weekly recap. Just as always, guys, check us out. World's greatest website, energynewsbeat.com. We'll see you on Monday, folks. Orsted strategic shakeup has its investors worried. Um, either, Michael, if you're going downhill, you either just speed up and keep going downhill or you try to hit your brakes and slow down. They don't know what they can do right here. Uh, the wind farm Orsted will present its new strategy on Wednesday. It faces a serious cutting edge targets either cutting dividends or asset sales uh, or how are they going to price themselves out? So Michael, let's go through some of these numbers here. Let's see here. Um, the numbers, the 50 gigawatt target has to be removed and the market knows it. This is a quote from their uh, financial uh, markets guy. The Bank of America analysis said recommending Orsted shares uh, by arguing the company can avoid the need for new capital by selling half of its U.S. businesses, reducing capital expenditures by 20 percent and cutting dividends by a quarter. Um, either they're going to have to keep hitting it and really producing it and then keep going, but they're going to lose more money. So do you want to go, uh, this is like the worst Ponzi scheme I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. Keep getting new money so that you can sink it into killing whales and then try to do this. So if they cut the losses, they cut their expenses, they're not going to be a very good investment. Yeah. So they've got their earnings coming up on Wednesday. It's part of the reason they leaked this. You know, if, if you're going to have bad news, you might as well leak it prior to the announcement so that when you hear it, you've already settled. And what they did say, and they passed this along, they're now seeing and, and the wind farms they're divesting in. Guess guess what they're selling them at? 12 years. Why? Because the maintenance is coming up. So you were, as I mentioned, you were close, Stu. You were plus or no. minus two years. You were close. But no, it's eight years. And and the the 12 years is when you buy the extra four years of time with the tax incentives and subsidies that are on there. So the eight years is actually the only amount of time those things can actually work. I can guarantee if you took a look at some of those fields, they didn't weren't operating for the first couple of years while they were trying to spin them up and get cables out. So, and, and, and remember, why, why is there this big shift in strategy? Well, remember, you know, in November uh, or, or, you know, over the last two years, they've set this pretty insane target of 50 gigawatts of renewable capacity. Most <laughs> of that offshore wind by the end of the decade. Now right. we, you've got a portfolio manager. I'm trying to find his name here. Um, or or whoever this person is, but regardless, the quote is the the fifty gigawatt target has to be removed, and the market knows it. But they also need to cut their financial goals so deep that it hurts. That's the quote. An investor wants to see them hurt. That when an investor says that, that means things drastically need to change because that's going to cause it. If their stock price is going to take a hit, it's not like their stock price with this announcement right. is going to go up per se. It may. It, it, it may not continue to fall. It may level out the falling because they, they understand that people are coming out. But this isn't going to hurt it, regardless of whether or not they're leaking it now. Oh, absolutely. Uh, they, they need to invest $69 billion to hit that. So, well, I, uh, I, well, I, yeah, I got no, you got no help over here, guys. Sorry. No, uh, it's out of my credit card limit. Laura Goldstein put this one out. When Trudeau's government doesn't know how much it's carbon tax reduces emissions you have to buy some serious entertainment on monday to read this one um 
our producer, this is absolutely a hoot. You take a look at this guy. He's got the Ukrainian flag uh, that he's in solidarity with. His Canada's Minister of Environment and Climate Change, Stephen uh, Gobert. Uh, so this is uh, this is John Kerry's counterpart. Sure, he's brilliant. Yeah. Sure, he's oh, brilliant. He is. He looks like he um, has got the brain power of a potato bud, but we'll just leave that alone for now. They don't know. And I let me read you some of this in here. Um, he posted Trudeau's radical environment min minister admits the government does not know, does not measure how many emissions are reduced by their costly carbon tax. Why? Because the carbon tax is not an iron environmental plan. It's a tax plan. Well, th this is the quote. So this this comes from the John Kerry of Canada. OK, just to put that in perspective. <laughs> If this is the quote, the government does not measure the annual amount of emissions that are directly reduced by the federal carbon pricing, retroactively attributing specific GHG reductions to a specific action such as carbon pricing, a discrete regulation or a discrete regulation or in a specific incentive is difficult given the multiple interacting factors that influence emissions, including carbon pricing, tax incentive, funding program, investor premises, and consumer demand. And that came out via the National Inventory Report. This is what the, the people who are supposed to be overseeing and understanding at the minute level how their policies are affecting the economy. I mean, he's literally the Minister of Environmental and Climate Change. I mean, that's, I mean, talk about waste. The Environment Minister... Oh, oh I just, absolutely. I just threw up in my mouth a little bit. But 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 they they don't even know. It's oh, no. it's actually insane. Uh all it is is a wealth transfer again. It's um, it, it's like a, the government or or any government coming out and say, "Oh, well, we don't actually know how much money we've sent overseas to help support this war." Oh wait, that's the United States considering we sent an extra 6 billion to Ukraine. Remember the accounting error? That that'll be next in for Canada. They're going to take a playbook out of us and say, "Oh, well, it was an accounting error plus or minus 6 billion." Well, that's almost like the accounting error in the uh, uh Pentagon. They lost 2 trillion dollars and then the following Monday was 9-11, and then the Pentagon was blown up where their records were. Go figure that out. So here we go. The, 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 the estimate net cost for people living in provinces under the federal carbon tax regime. Okay, so right here. You basically got it starts at $65 per ton of emissions, and then, right. the set, and then it, it's going to then increase to 170 come 2030. But what's crazy is if you adjust that for living standards, you're talking it could be $700 in Alberta, $2,700 in Ontario, um, or excuse me, um, 400, excuse me, it's 710 in Alberta right now, could go up to 2,700 in 2030. Ontario's 478, could go up to 1,800. Saskatchewan 410, could go all the way up to 17000 or $1,700. Manitoba three. I mean, basically everything's about to triple come 2030, but they don't right. even, they don't even know how much it's helping. It doesn't help any. All it does is pass the buck around and it, it again, it's another tax and is a direct in uh, impacting of inflation and destroying the lower and uh, middle class. Yeah, I mean, you, you said it best. Oh, yeah. All right. Let's go to Steinberg embraces nuclear energy and supports a third nuclear reactor at Millstone. Uh, this is pretty darn cool. Uh, when we take a look at the... Uh, Chair, uh, Representative Jonathan Steiberg, a uh, Democrat out of Westport, is now one of its staunchest supporters. I'm pretty thrilled when we have people on both sides of the aisle work together. Quote, unquote, uh, this is from him. When I first came to the legislature, I didn't know about energy like anyone else. I flipped the switch and the lights came on. He said, then there was a little skeptical of nuclear. We thought it was always yesterday's kind of energy. But as soon as I started doing my homework, I discovered that nuclear was a viable option. It's carbon free. And if you do a really good managing it, the environment and the safety concerns, it should be considered in the mix. Hats off to the Democrat. I like him. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't like him. I don't know him, but at least I liked what he said. Yeah, I mean. It's it's about time somebody came out and exactly what did he say? 
He just flipped the lights on and just assumed they'd come on. He didn't really think about the chain reaction that goes down. So, again, we applaud people for doing their education. There's still a – I think the, the the problem is when people just say, well, nuclear is the answer. Well, if it was the answer, don't you think we would have gotten there at this point? There – um, I did I only know only uh, no only because it was harder to uh, siphon funds off of nuclear because it was uh, bigger building projects and stuff. The new Green New Deal allowed for a lot of money transitioning from the wealthy to the wealthy and off of the backs of the middle and uh, lower class. So the answer is. Nuclear is too stable. It, it it definitely is, you know, and and I applaud him. And, you know, again, yes. we applaud Steinberg for coming out here and doing this. You know, all the money that they're trying to send Ukraine right now is is could is. could have poured that into nuclear and had a few of these guys up and running. Well, it's just and, and absolutely, and he I, Steinberg also noted that the nuclear power can also reduce risks of blackout and brownouts. And thank goodness for uh, Meredith Anglin uh, on the shorting of the grid. I love uh, love her, but she also talked about you got to have that baseline on the grid, Michael. Can't, no baseline, it. all bad. Yep. So all let's, right, go let's to move to the Arctic. Hey, speaking of Putin, um, you know, they, they were trying to call ahead of, hey, uh, you know, I'm glad I was able to uh, get Tucker and Putin all set up. But yep, did you that know good. that Tucker just put out on, on X that the uh, CIA was hacked into his signal account and they said, you got to come get approval if you're going to go interview Putin? Yeah, he he not- ran that on Fox News a, a- in in November, right? He came out and said that on on Fox, one of his monologues. Oh yeah, but no, this was in, this was one he just had a release out mm-hmm. on. It was like holy smokes, dude! Um, that they're they're watching him. Uh, well, we okay. appreciate you brokering that. Oh yeah, not uh, I do not need them listening to me. Uh, China objects to UN fund warnings on solar's forced labor risks. You know what? If you, you know, this one just kind of really gets me kind of worked up in the hypocrisy range here. Mm -hmm. China has opposed the green projects by the UN's flagship climate fund because their documents mention the risk of forced labor in the Chinese dominated supply chains of solar panels. There is more to this article than what is in the article. Uh, let me just tell you this. Um, it's unacceptable. Uh, China's, I'm going to butcher this one. Boy, this is bad. Michael, it's Yang Zi Lui uh, <laughs> said the unsubstantiated allegations or so called forced labor allegations in the solar supply chain included project document. It's unacceptable. <laughs> to have this presumption of guilt and stigmatization of the uh, PV photogenic uh, supply chain. Uh, Chinese PV should be treated as fair, just non-discriminatory manner. And I just thought I got tickled at this, but Michael, the real story behind this um, is because China, uh, even though the UN, it, this is trying to stop the uh, Belt and Road Initiative, which I've covered with George uh, uh, McMillan, mm-hmm. is the fact that the UN's, the WEF and the w- and the UN are trying to finance renewable projects around the Belt and Road Initiative. So the UN is trying to cash in on this. And so they're throwing rocks at China, which is pretty stupid. Yeah. And. You know, I don't think this is something that gets talked about nearly as much as it should. I mean, we know it, it we know that we're all familiar with the forced labor that's going on with the Congo and the conflict minerals. You know, that right. probably we haven't talked about as much. But this is the other side of the coin. I mean, the, the problem is you have in this uh, Xinjiang region, which is the source of two. <laughs> 
of the world's solar grade polysilicon. And that's a key input into solar. It, yes. Problem is we know that there's what can probably, you know, what, you know, the, what, what's been reported by the UN is a serious human rights violation going on there, specifically against the Uyghur population. So, you know, Obviously, China's going to push back. They're not a huge fan. All to that, I say, once your companies stop having to stop having to construct nets around the building so that people don't have to jump and catch them, then I'll take your human rights seriously. But as long as I'm seeing nets, I'm not believing any of that. So we're going to take them off the sandstone headquarters. <laughs> yeah, we're going to. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, there's somewhere else I'd like to take the nets off of, but uh, that's for another. Go. But um. But, you know, you sit back and kind of go, I just lost my train of thought. But that was good. That was a good one, Mike. Why Americans don't want electric vehicles. Why do you think that, just give me your first opinion on this. Well, because I saw a tweet the other day from, uh, I, I won't call the guy out, but his name, um, he's he's a prominent, he's a prominent energy, like renewable energies guy on Twitter. Right. And he tweeted out something of the effect of, my app won't work, so I can't get into my Tesla. No way. Yep. <laughs> the app wasn't syncing with it. So why don't I like EVs? Too electronic. I like, I got my four wheel drive on a block. I don't need the government driving me to no. right to the, right to the, the police station when I make a wrong turn. Uh, the government doesn't like me anyway, but we'll leave that alone. And that's maybe not EVs as much as it is the electronic car part. I think right. the problem with EVs is especially like the cold. Maybe in a hot weather environment, it works. Right. Like, think about that cold streak we just had. Oh. Uh, and they don't. Here's where the number one thing was. Uh, fewer drivers are interested in driving electric vehicles. Uh, Hertz, uh, according to a new survey, this is further confirmed by Hertz's recent announcement to sell 20,000 electric cars in its fleet. We'll be able to uh, get them cheap. Oh, no, I would. But you got to buy a new battery for $20,000. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, now, here's the thing. Uh the zero, uh, the number one issue is the charging stations. Yep. Charging stations are a failure. Um, and then the zero emissions label is misleading. This is coming up into a whole energy thread that we have is that the numbers for the green energy yesterday on our podcast, we talked about the UK and how they are misleading uh, the electricity. Electricity. Mm -hmm. Uh, the green, I've interviewed several uh, big people on uh, green energy and how climate crisis is being misreported. Mm -hmm. That's coming out here as well, too. So um, when you sit back and take a look, who can afford, Michael, the tax incentives? The rich. Mm hmm. You think the poor people will ever care about a tax incentive? <laughs> Absolutely, because they don't have enough free capital to spend. No. Unfortunately, there are some. I know this comes as a shock to some people, but there there are some people in the world that just have to buy what's around them because it's cheap, and they don't have that much money. We don't just have all this oh. excess money to have a political stance around. No, and I, I just felt so, so sorry for all the folks in Chicago that had to wait eight hours to charge their car. Now. Uh, on a side note, I'm about ready to go to the next story, Michael, but Toyota um, is leading the charge on their um, hybrids. You and I have been talking about hybrid hybrids for over two years. Yep. And I'm all in on having a hybrid car and getting another two, Ford 250. Mm -hmm. No, uh, not a Ford. Oh, yeah. I want a two. Hybrids are definitely the most, the best of both worlds. I'm all for battery backup on houses, especially when you have, when the grid mm -hmm. is in such crazy condition like right. we're in. You know, this is, this is a, uh, uh, not an opinion piece, but more of a research paper. Jason Isaac, he's the founder and CEO of the American Energy Institute. Okay. Yep. He recently was in front of Congress, the Senate or in the Senate Energy and Natural Resources. Committee. They heard they had a hearing on the federal electrical vehicle incentive that says is that basically what their what their research showed is that every EV sold places an nearly fifty thousand dollar additional cost to taxpayers. And what? yes, and then you have uh, the tires. Tires are lasting yep. less than five thousand miles. 
Uh, why are the tires on EVs loud? Why is that? My tire, I mean, my tires are bald right now, but they've lasted a while. 30,000, 40,000 miles. It's because the weight, the oh, weight, and then the car parking lots are failing. You start putting in because an EV, uh, the weight on an EV is 14, 15 times more than a no normal car. You're right. They're much heavier. It's no, it's, it, I mean, so, I'm not driving an EV, trust me. No, but a hybrid gets you 60 miles per gallon. Oh, yeah, I'm all about the hybrid. I'm all in on the hybrid. There we go. It is the true costs of net zero are becoming impossible to hide. Um, you know, it is becoming impossible to hide because the data is now surfacing. Mm -hmm. They have been hiding the data, Michael, for so long that they're even manipulating the data in the uh, Arctic on that it's now the hottest summer, uh, hottest year in history. Well, it's because they've manipulated the data yep. in order to do it. And it's kind of cool finding out how they're doing it now. Britain dumps another net zero uh, gimmick. The Wall Street uh, reports this. Uh, they use natural gas to fuel the cabinet sized broilers mm -hmm. that provide central heating and hot water, forcing them to dot electric heat pumps. <laughs> electric heat pumps, my book, don't work nearly as efficiently in the BTUs. Mm -hmm. uh, the British thermal, it's kind of ironic, British thermal, uh, that uh, it does not work nearly as high because you have uh, either coal or wind and solar, and it, it does not work. So anyway, I thought that was pretty funny. The wind tax. Uh, I thought this was another one, the Biden mm -hmm. wind tax. Uh, the U.S. manufacturers have yet to stand up to, I'm not going to use the word, all right, idiotic regulations. This is a quote out of the article. This is yep, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. just... Hey, Google, this is a quote out of the article. So Biden's schemes are unraveling and uh, Bloomberg reports a 48 percent surge in cost uh, that wrecks his much needed wind farm power plans. Forty eight percent cost on that. And so. Oh, hey, uh, everybody, for our folks uh, watching out there, we have the R.T. Trevino. We do. He's the big dog over there at Pecos operating, and we love you, R.T. Thanks, for, you. thanks for stopping by, baby. Absolutely. All right. Well, and, and just, then the wind farms are even being canceled in New Jersey, mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's a great thing because they're killing all the right whales up there. And uh, Well, it's going to come back to the East Coast continues to shoot themselves in the foot. Uh, and, I think and, a little higher than that. And they're going to end up like we all we keep saying they're going to end up back on Russian crude. Don't you worry. They oh, will yeah. end up on Russian crude. Right. Uh, I, I'm going to have something on that here in just a minute. Uh, and I think I might as well just give my two cents here. Um, uh, watch what happens shortly on Tucker Carlson. Mm -hmm. Tucker Carlson is yep. going to be in. He's already interviewed Putin. So, you know, hey, we were teasing about the, hey. you know, hey, my Putin imitation. And when when Tucker Carlson releases that there is going to be a huge backlash, yep. they're already trying to ban. I believe you just said that they're trying to um, the EU. Yep. Yeah, the EU is putting a travel ban on him on Tucker Carlson. Yeah, yeah. it's because the same he, one that you've got. Right. Uh, I don't blame them because, you know, I'm I'm going to go up to. Schwab, you know, Charles Schwab and say, yep. hey, dude, you're a nut. Now, here's the thing. What you're going to find out is I think that Tucker Carlson is going to go ahead and expose that there was a deal. Mm -hmm. There was a ceasefire between Ukraine and Russia. Mm -hmm. The Biden administration and the EU Hand it. Yep. They sent Boris Johnson down there to blow the deal up. Exactly. Now, here's what's going to happen. I think that people are going to say Putin's a bad guy, but he's not that bad guy. And so energy makes a difference. And mm -hmm. I think you're going to see an opening up within six months of people buying uh, uh, Russian. Interesting. And, and that's not talked about. And I think you heard it here first, Michael, and I've got a few other things I'm working on to back that number up with. So.